but maybe it does. All right, let's get into this. Last night, I talked about sincere faith. Um, you probably remember this now, and I mentioned this morning that I may have given you the impression that, it's, uh, that none of us has a sincere faith, but that's not what I mean at all. I just mean if this faith is worth doing, it's going to be worth doing properly, right? Because what's the point of having a half kind of faith? Now, I, I remember when I was first in my first paid ministry job, okay? I thought all my Christmases had come for once. For, at once, I had worked in ministry for all of my life since I was about 15. I'd done Sunday school, I'd led youth groups, I'd done everything like that, and I got my first paid gig as a young adults pastor at a church in Strathpine, and I was paid $60 a week, and I was like, yes, finally I've arrived, right? <laughs> anyway, my, my first job, uh, you know, it was a wonderful experience, learned some things. One of the things I, I, I enjoyed about working with young adults is just the energy, the enthusiasm. I've really enjoyed being here with you guys and seeing your, your enthusiasm for things. It's just, it's fantastic. Now, what used to happen is, uh, as you, you, you're in ministry, you learn things as you go along, I had this, um, the, this person come to my office every now and then and, they, and they'd say, oh, Pastor Lex, um, I failed God again. And I go, well, let's talk about what is going on, what's happening. I'd pray with them. I'd give some suggestions about how they might improve the failure rate, you know, do something better. And then a month or so later, I'd get them back in my office and I'd say, Pastor Lex, we failed God again. And I'd say, well, here's some things to improve it, and then a month or so later, she'd be in my office again and say, Pastor Lex, I've failed God again. And this thing came to me, and I don't know if it's from God, but it came to me very powerfully. I said, I have a solution to your problem. She said, what is it? I said, go and sin as much as you like. And they're like, what? I said, because here's the problem. Make a choice. You're either going to go and do it or you're going to not do it. But halfway between is the most miserable place you'll ever be. You either got to decide to go full on that way or full on that way. But this halfway between thing, it just leaves you miserable. It leaves me miserable. Nobody ever gets better. Now, I don't think that's good advice, by the way. I'm not giving you that advice tonight. Well, in fact, I am giving you a piece of advice that I think you, you need to hear very strongly, as I said to them. I don't think you should do that, but that's one of your choices. What I'd like you to do is just, just go full on for God, because that halfway bit between maybe I will, maybe I won't, that'll destroy your life, that'll make your life miserable. And some of you, you can probably relate to this right now as I've even spoken to you, going, you know what, I know exactly what that's like. I feel like you know, I'm going to go with God wants everything that he wants, and then, boom, I feel like I fell, and I, I'm going to give it up, and I'm feeling very miserable. So my encouragement to you is that what we need to do is have this genuine, sincere faith. And, and what happened was, um, I wanted to talk to you about that part today, and I wanted to give you some tips about how you can actually fan that faith into flame. The scripture that we have for tonight is that scripture you've, you've already been aware of. It says, you know, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. Uh, that first what with your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice and now I'm sure dwells with you we talked about that all of us in some ways have a legacy of faith whether it was the person the, the, the chappy at school or the uh, the person that we saw or someone who handed us the Bible that we we had or whether it was our mother or whether it was our father or whether it was some other kind of legacy a grandmother we have that legacy but we have a job to do and our job is to fan this gift into flame. That's what the verse is for this camp. I remind you, he said, for this reason, because you have a sincere faith, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. And you can see that uh, on the screen up there. Um, and what I wanted to do tonight is I wanted to talk to you, uh, before we start this passage, um, I wanted to talk to you again about fire. Right, because, as I said to you the other night, um, you know, I, I've had to light a few fires because my wife and I bought this property at Esk, and it's a, it's a bush block, and uh, it's been let go to rack and ruin, and so there's a lot of dead trees and a lot of things that need to be sorted out, and uh, I'm managing to sort them out. But here's one of the problems that has happened over this last few months here, uh, you know, for us, in fact, quite a long time, is who's noticed that it's rained a bit more than usual? Now, let, who knows also that fires and rain don't really mix that well together, right? Yeah. 
So um, here I am trying to light the fire, trying to get it growing, but everything is wet and everything is hard to light, right? But I can get it going, but it just seems to struggle. Have you ever had this problem when you're trying to light a fire and it just won't get going? Well, I want to tell you a secret. I didn't learn this in voice. I didn't learn this in Boy Scouts, by the way. I went back up to the shed and I got the battery-operated leaf blower. Because I'd be there going <laughs> and nearly passing out, right? Can't get the fire going. So I get the leaf blower, put it on, you know, blast, and then and that flame just starts to take off. It's burning. I, I turn it off and it's still flickering away, flickering away. This oxygen that I discovered a science experience makes that flame go bright. So I just left it there and left it there and left it there and that flame was so hot that it started to melt the end of the, the leaf blower. And then I took it away and guess what? That fire is going like crazy. Why? Because I fanned it into flame, right? The, the, and, and here's what I want to tell you about your life. You might have a life where everything is wet, right? Soggy. You've got troubles. Things just don't seem to be going. Your faith just doesn't seem to be going anywhere. You've tried to light the fire of faith. You've tried to get the faith going, but, but there's damp things in your life, like there's family problems. There's, there's problems with your friends at school. There's, there's the problems that you have emotionally, and there's difficulty things that you have. There's, there's things that creep into your life that draw you away from God, and, and that fire just never seems to get going, right? Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many people here tonight have had this experience where you want that fire to go? but it's just too wet. You know, your life just feels like this, this forever incessant rain where everything is damp and nothing is going anywhere. What I want to do tonight, my proposition to you, is that I want to tell you how we can get that fanned into flame. What are some of the things that you can do that will take the leaf blower to your faith, right? What are some things you can do that will literally, you know, turbocharge your faith? And I'm going to give you some things. They come from the book of Timothy, by the way. So we've, we've got a verse here in 2 Timothy chapter 1. It's verse 5 and verse 6. That's, that's the, the verses we've been looking at. But I thought to myself, well, what does Paul... Because remember, Paul is talking to Timothy and he's saying, I want you to grow and I want you to fan this gift into flame. So I thought maybe, just maybe, there's some things in this book that tell us how to fan the gift into flame. Maybe Paul's writing a letter that's giving some instructions about how Timothy could indeed fan the gift into flame. So I've got a whole bunch of things. I'm just going to throw them out as quick as I can. These are some ways that Paul tells Timothy he can fan his faith into flame. And these are some ways that I'm going to tell you you can fan your faith into flame. And they come straight out of the book of 2 Timothy. Here's the first one own it. If you want to fan the gift in the flame, you've got to own it. It's got to be yours. It cannot be someone else's faith. It has to be yours. You can't be ashamed of it, right? You have to own it. You have to strut it out like it's real. I get that from the scriptures where it says here in uh, 2 Timothy in, in chapter 1 verse 8, it says, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God. You know, those words, do not be ashamed. It's this idea, don't cower in your faith, you know. It's, don't, it's, it's not like, um, yeah, like don't give up on your faith. Just, you just got to own this thing. Are you going to be a Christian or not? You can't be half a Christian, yeah. right? You can't be a, uh, you know, like I say, cosplay Christian. There's no such thing as a cosplay Christian. You either are or you aren't. And so you have to own it. And, and I think that's the, the most important thing that Paul's saying to Timothy. He's basically saying this. There has to come a time in your life where you just trust God and you just say, no matter what it is, I'm going to own that, that moment of truth. Now, here's the thing I want to add to this because I think it's very important. Some of you are going, yeah, but if I say I'm a Christian, people are going to say, you know, how stupid I am and how bad things are. And those Christians, they're like this. Well, I just want to give a caveat to this. Here's what I'm saying to you. Own your faith, but don't be stupid. You know, one of the things about Christians is they're, they're, they're stupid sometimes. They're arrogant. They're big-mouthed, right? They say stuff that upsets people. What have I written here? Uh, they're obnoxious, right? I'm not telling you to be obnoxious. In fact, please, 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 can we just be a bunch of Christians who grew up not being obnoxious, right? Not being... Um, arrogant 
Now, one of the things I find about Christians, you know, who kind of get themselves obnoxious is they become arrogant about this. They're ignorant about the things of the world, but they're arrogant about their faith. This is the worst kind of Christian to be, right? I'm not asking you to be that. I'm asking you to own your faith and to live it in real, genuine way, right? But not to be that obnoxious person who, you know, has got to say something about this and that without showing love. We'll get to that on another night, but, but Jesus says that we should love others as Jesus loved us. So what about you? That's the hard question, right? Are you ready to get the leaf blower out? You have to own this thing. You have to say, yes, I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to own it. I'm going to live it, okay? The second thing is the piece of advice that Paul gave Timothy was this. He said, to fan your gift of faith into flame, you need to find a mentor, right? Someone who can teach you, someone who can help you. You heard this from Jacob this morning in that testimony time. He said he got alongside some people who stood with him, who helped him, right? Who mentored him, who had good things for him, right? Timothy says this in, uh, in, sorry, Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. He says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. In other words, Paul says this in other places. He says, follow me as I follow Christ, you know? Just as I'm following Jesus, you should follow me. The question for us is this. Do you want to fan that gift into flame? Do you want to get the blowtorch out on your, your faith? Then find someone who can walk with you in this journey, right? Find someone who can sow into your life. Grab one of the leaders that, that is here at camp that you've already been talking to. Get their telephone number. Get the email, you know. Talk to them. Get them to encourage you. That's the way you'll fan it into flame. What happens with a fire if you take the coal out of the fire and you put it over there? It goes out. What happens to that coal if you put it back in the fire? It'll catch fire, right? You want your faith to be fanned into flame? Then you need somebody who can help you walk the journey with you. The third thing, way to fan the faith into flame as Paul is that you need to embrace grace. Now, I read this, uh, uh, you know, if you try harder to do church, you try harder to do faith, you try harder to be good, to do that good Christian thing, you'll never really understand what Christianity is about. Christianity isn't about trying harder, it's about letting God's grace work in you, right? And it's hard because when you grow up in church, you learn the Bible stories, some of you, you learn uh, how to act in church, you learn the things that you're supposed to do and not supposed to do, but you don't always learn this fact, that Jesus gave us a free gift of grace. It's a loving gift of grace. He said, you don't have to work to earn the forgiveness that I offer you. This is a gift to you. This is a free gift to you. And yet what the church wants to do to us is uh, what we feel like the church is saying to us is, be good. And Jesus is saying, you, don't, you can't be good. Only I'm good, says Jesus. And I can help you. That's the strength of it. You have to own that grace. You have to embrace that grace. You have to be strengthened by that grace. Um, if you just embrace legalism or, you know, the, the rules, you'll actually completely miss out on everything that makes your faith vibrant and whole. If you just simply adopt, what, what does the Pharisee, like the, Jesus had a lot to say about the Pharisees, and he said, you guys, you, 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 you're trying to keep all the letter of the law, but you, you're missing the whole point, right? You, you, what does he say? You strain out a little gnat or a little fly, but you swallowed the camel. You know, you literally, you tried to keep the rules, but you literally missed the whole huge camel. Sometimes we do that. And what we do is we need to embrace the grace of God. Here's the fourth thing that's going to help you fan this into flame, right? And it's become a disciple maker. Why the quickest, what do they say? There's this saying that, um, that if you want to learn something, then become a teacher. But truthfully, uh, when you teach, you learn. I love being a teacher. You know why? Because I learn. I'm learning, learning, learning all the time. I'm learning because I can be a teacher. This is the model that Jesus gave us. He said, you are discipled, you also disciple others, right? You receive, you also give. You got from me, you give to others. You receive love, you show love. You receive grace, you show grace. You receive forgiveness, you show forgiveness. You receive mercy, you show mercy. You receive discipleship, you show discipleship. That's the way it's supposed to work. When you try and take it all on to yourself, just for yourself, that's the way you lose, right? But you want your faith to come alive. I'll tell you, there's no better way to have your faith alive 
and you step out and start to help somebody else and you're like, oh my gosh, God, you've got to help me. Now, I can hear some of you saying tonight, but I don't know enough. I couldn't possibly help anybody. I'll let you in on a secret for, t for what you are as a teacher. You know what a teacher has to know? To teach. Some of your teachers are going to hate me for this. You know what a teacher has to know? Just a little bit more than the student. That's it. Just a little bit more. <laughs> you learn, you teach. You learn, you teach. You learn, you teach. I'm telling you, if you want to fan your faith into flame, find somebody else that you can help. You, you know, you're feeling sad about your life. Find someone else who's sad and help them. You're feeling down about what's happening. Find someone else who's feeling down and help them. You know, you're feeling uh, that God gave you a little something that was special for you. Share that something special with someone else. I'll guarantee you that's one of the greatest ways to, to fan your, um, your faith into flame. I'm going to skip the Hebrews verse, uh, and, but I want to challenge you this. Oh, sorry. Well, the, the Hebrews verse, Hebrews 5 verse 12 says, by now, you, this is the scripture speaking to us, by now you should be teachers. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the first things you need to know from God's word. You still need milk, milk instead of solid food. I mean, the author of the Hebrews is saying, come on. How come I got to get the bottle out and feed you still? Now, some, I've often said this, there's 40-year-old people still in the church that are demanding they get their bottle. Feed me, feed me, feed me. And, God, and God's saying in his scriptures, no, stop it. By now, you should be feeding yourself. Not only feeding yourself, you should be feeding someone else. You know, this is the, this is the great way that the, the life of faith works. As you, you receive from God, you also pass on to others. That's the great challenge for all of us. And, you know, um, I want you to think like this. Don't be afraid to help somebody. Don't be afraid. You know, when someone says, I'm really struggling with this, you pray for them. Why not? You know, you, you don't need a pastor to do that. There's not something mystical or magical about a person standing up here who's speaking. You know, that's not, that doesn't make them better than you. What makes the, you good is that you do what God calls you to do for now, right? And when someone's needing your help, you help them. You know, when someone needs a prayer, you pray for them. When someone needs healing, you help them, right? When someone needs advice about what to do, you tell them what you learned in the scripture when you read it just today in your soap reading, right? That's part of how it works. You begin doing that, I guarantee you, that's like taking a blowtorch to your faith. It'll start to burn bright. Here's number five. This is all from Timothy, remember, and it all comes from what Paul is telling Timothy to do, things that he can do. And the fifth thing that you can do to fan your faith into flame is put in some effort. You know, actually, I'm not talking about earning God's grace because you know you can't, right? But if you had a relationship with a girl... Guys, if you had a relationship with a girl and you never put any effort in, how do you think that would go for you? Those of you who are married, if you didn't put any effort in, how's that going to work out for you? Not so well, but the relationship's there, right? But with Christians, here's what we do. God saved me, I'm okay, and I don't have to do anything. He needs to do everything for me, right? God should do everything for me. And he's going, no, that's not how it works. I'll help you, I'll empower you, but you better do something. There's a saying by a guy named um, Dallas Willard, and uh, he says this, he said, God is not opposed to, uh, sorry, <laughs> he's not opposed to effort, he's opposed to earning. But you can't earn it, but I tell you what, he wants you to put some effort in. You can't earn God's grace, you can't earn his favour, but if you want a relationship with him, it's going to take some work. And for some of us, we've been sitting back for way too long going, God, come on, why don't you change me? And he's going, well, come on, why don't you do something? <laughs> and you're going, come on, I go to church, why don't you change me? And he's going, come on, why don't you step up and do something? You step up and do something, I'll empower you, right? You sit back and wait for something to happen, nothing's going to happen, right? So God's not opposed to effort, he's opposed to earning. You can't earn salvation, you can't earn grace, but boy, you can do something and you should. 2 Timothy 2, 5, 6 says this. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Who gets the crops? The hard worker. Who gets the fruit? The one who labelled in the vineyard. Right? This is how it works. You want to fan your gift of faith into flame? I tell you, just put some effort in. 
right? You know, get up, re- read the Bible, you know, be the disciple maker, uh, do something like that's going to make a, make a big change. You, you don't win the prize or eat the fruit if you don't first run the race or plant the harvest, right? It's like going to the gym. You go to the gym, you go every morning, you sit down there and you look at the machines. Yeah, that's a, that's a machine. That'll, that'll get your muscles going, yeah. You know, and if you use that machine, you'll get better abs, and if you use that machine, your pecs will be good, and you, if you use that machine, your thigh muscles and your calf muscles and whatever, and, and you learn all about the machines, and then you go home. And you say, come on, machines, do something. And the machines are saying, no, 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 you do something. I'll benefit you, but you have to do something, right? You want abs, right? Clearly, I've got one. If you want abs, <laughs> you've got to do something. And, and I think so t- for too long in the church, we've sat back and said, God, you do something. You change me. You make me stronger. And he's saying, no, you do something. You've got to put in some effort, right? Here's number six. Six way to fan your gift into flame is don't get sidetracked. Now, I get this from the words in 2 Timothy 2.14 where it says, remind them of this, telling Timothy, remind them of these things and charge them before God. In other words, tell them, before God I'm telling you this, not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. How many times do you hear in churches, denominations, everybody saying, you don't do it right, you don't sing the right songs, you don't do the church right, you haven't got this right, you haven't got that right, I know better than you. Paul's telling Timothy this very clearly. He says, if you get into that line of thinking, then you're losing the race. You will not fan your gift of faith and flame. Some people th- proud themselves in being, I'm the ones who can, I'm standing up for the pure church and I'm going to protect this and that. And you know what, actually, I think they're losing absolutely everything in that position, right? Where you gain is where you give. Where you gain is where you don't get yourself. He says, don't get yourself caught up in these petty arguments. In one of the places it says, those people will pierce themselves and ruin themselves because they get involved in that. Do you want to ruin your faith? This is it, petty arguments. You want to build your faith? Stay away from them. Stay with the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. All right, here's number seven. The seventh way to fan your faith into flame is to run from danger. You know, one of the great problems of faith is when we flirt with danger. When we head towards the cliff or hang close to the edge of the cliff, where we flirt with sin and trouble and difficulty. Paul says this in 2 Timothy 2, 22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So what's he saying? He says, run away from those things that will kill you and kill your faith. Run away from the things that will ruin your faith and pursue good things. Don't just replace those things with nothing. Replace them with something, right? So here's what we often do is we see how close we can get to the problems, you know, to the sin, to the difficulty, to the troubles. We say, well, how close can I get? Can I put my foot in the water and still be okay? Can I, can I do a little bit of this? Can I dabble with a little bit of this and still be okay? Let me tell you straight up, you want your faith to die. If you want it to feel like it's been raining for six months and you'll never get that fire lighted again, that's how you do it. You dabble in the stuff that's going to cause you a problem. What Paul says is, Timothy, run the other direction, right? This is our job, right? That's the effort. Pursue righteousness, Pursue peace and, and those kind of things that God causes you, faith and love and righteousness, and that's what we should be doing, right? So how do you fan the gift into flame? Get away from that stuff, right? Run towards the stuff that's going to help you. So here's number eight. This is the way to fan your gift into flame, is hang around people who will help your faith. People who will build your faith. And that's from 2 Timothy 2, 22. It says this, So flee, evil, uh, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love and peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. Who are you spending time with? People who call on the name of the Lord. Who are you spending time with? People who follow Jesus. 
Who are you spending time with? People who love God. Who are you spending time with? People who are disciples of Jesus. If you spend time with disciples of Jesus, that'll fan your gift of faith into flame, right? If you spend all of your time nowhere near the disciples of Jesus, that's going to drag your faith down. So how do you fan it into flame? Events like this. You know, come to youth camp, hang around with some of the other people who are believers, hang around with leaders who, who've walked this journey before you, listen to what they have to say. That's going to change your life. That'll be a blowtorch to your faith. Here's number nine, and I've kind of touched on that, and that's this same idea is that that if you hang around with people who, who uh, uh, don't hang around with people, sorry, who will drag you down. Now, again, this is the same kind of thing like, like, like sin, for example. You get as close as you can, you see if you can put your foot in, right? And, and will I still survive? But some of us, we're hanging around with some people who aren't helping us at all, right? And you know it. You want to be their friend, you're desperate to be their friend, but they're dragging you further and further away. And you, you kind of know, I can be strong, I'll be okay, everything will be fine. And eventually you're led kind of into, into darkness, right? And, and suddenly you're lost and you just don't know how to get back into the light. Because that's what happens, right? You hang around with people who are dragging you down. Now, I'm not saying, Jesus said you have to be in the world, but what? Not of the world. You, you're in the world, but you don't become the world. They're, they're going to try and drag you down. They're going to try, a lot of them, not a lot, all of them, but certainly there are some people that will kill your faith. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. They're not going to listen to good teaching. But having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. He's basically saying there are people out there that will just get stuff that makes you happy, that suits whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. It's okay to be whatever you want. It's okay to do whatever you want. When God says, actually, that's not how to survive. That's not how faith works. You need to fan it into flame. So I'm just saying to you, the hard part for some of you is this. Some of you are going to have to say goodbye to some of your friends. I don't, I don't like saying that, but it's true. Not all of you, because some of you, it's the right place for you to be there and you are bringing a Christian witness to that. We're called to do that, right? But for some of you, know for a fact that they're dragging you away, right? They're slowly dragging you. You can feel your faith dying every day but you still want to hang on to them. This would be one of the hardest decisions you ever make in your life, but walk away. Here's number 10. How can you fan your faith into flame? You embrace the power of faith, not the form of faith. Right? You embrace the power of faith, not the form of faith. One thing that will kill your faith is if you just copy the rituals. Right? If you just go through the motions of faith, if you just go to church, if you just pretend you have a faith, we talked about this the other night. It's, it's, but the thing that'll change you is embracing the power of faith, right? Because you can just act like a certain thing, uh, but it's the, it's the transformation inside of you that makes the difference. That's why, uh, as Jacob said this morning from uh, Romans 12, 2, where it says, you know, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. That's your spiritual worship, right? That's how God transforms you and he gives you the kind of things that you ought to do. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, these people in the last days have the appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. Avoid such people. Now, these are the people, sometimes they're in the church. I'm just going to say it. It's sad to say it, right? There are some people in the church, they're more interested in legalism, they're more interested in bondage, they're more interested in rules, than they, and they don't even know the power of the resurrection of Jesus, right? We're going to talk about this on another night, but we're going to talk about this fact that there needs to be a powerful encounter. God's, God's, the faith in God is actually not religion, right? It's not an actions of a religious organization. Faith in God is actually transforming power of God himself who chooses to dwell in us. And one of the quickest ways to, drench, uh, to, dr to quench the flame in your faith is you, if you offer the appearance of Christianity but not, not understand the power. It just, it just won't fan it into flame. What fans it into flame is the actual ignition point, you know, the, the power itself. 
If you're just doing it to keep people happy, if you're just doing it to try to keep God happy, because you, know, you might zap me, it, it'll be the weakest and hardest thing you'll ever done. But if you, if you go to God and say, show me who you really are, show me your power, then that'll change your life, right? Here's, here's the final one, number 11. How do you fan your faith into flame? This is all from Timothy. All the advice that Paul gave Timothy, well, as much of it as I drew out of the, the chapters there, from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and it's, and it's read the Bible. And 2 Timothy 3, 16 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All scripture. So, you know, it's saying the Bible has truths in it that can help you. But if you don't follow it and you don't read it, then you don't get any help from it, right? You want to fan your faith into flame, see what he says. See what the Bible says. Read it. I'll just give you a quick illustration of this. All scriptures breathe out for God and is profitable for teaching. Now, um, I remember years ago, Mark was, was the football coach, like the, the soccer coach for one of my boys. And I think one year I did under sevens or under eights or something, uh, soccer coaching. Here, here, I just want to give you a quick illustration of what the Bible can do from these and, what it, and liken it to soccer. In soccer, we have teaching, right? So if you think about what are you teaching them, how to play the game, right? You're going to teach them what an offside is. You're going to teach them you know, where, how you score goals. You're going to teach them how to throw the ball. You're going to teach them what you can use to kick the ball. You can teach them their positions. Can you play soccer properly if you don't know those things? No, you just can't, right? You can maybe give it a go, but unless you know the rules of the game, you, you can't play the game properly. So there's an element of teaching in soccer. We call that doctrine, the doctrine of soccer, if you like. So here we have this idea in Christianity. If you don't know the rules of the game, how can you play? You, you can't play, right? So what's the scripture good for? It'll teach you the rules of the game. Here's the second thing. It's good for reproof. And reproof is like this. It's, it's a telling off, right? You know, like you, you're, you're telling them, stop it. So like if you're teaching, if you're doing under seven soccer, they all follow the ball, right? That's the first thing that happens. Everyone follows the ball. You know, no one keeps their position. And sometimes they're running the wrong way. So the coach from the sideline goes, stop. You're going the wrong way. Turn around. You're not supposed to run there. You know, like that, okay? D does any of you like to be reproved like that? You know, told off like that? No, but it's part of the game, right? And why is the coach doing that? Because he's trying to help you learn how to play better, like to, to understand the positions, right? So what's the Bible good for? It can actually tell you off when you need it. You're running the wrong way. So the, the, there's doctrine there, how to play the game. But there's also a telling off every now and then, it says, stop it, you're running the wrong way. Here's the third thing that it offers you here. It says, correction. Now, correction is like the half-time talk in soccer, right? Get the kids off. Now, listen, when you're going for the goal, remember, if you're out on the left wing, kick it in towards the striker, you know you're going to score a goal better. But if you just keep over here and keep it in the centre, you're just not going to get it. So when you see the ball coming down the left-hand side, run, you know, like that. What's that? That's, that's a little correction, right? It's like you're going the right direction. You've got the right idea, just a little bit to the left, right? You see that? So when you read the scripture, what's it doing for you? It's saying to you, hey, you got it pretty right, but here's a little tweak. Here's a little way in which you can do better. Right? And then what's the final one? It says, um, and training, right? Now, what's training? What, what happens here in training? Why do you go to soccer training? What? Do you get better, right? Why do you keep doing it? Why do you keep practicing those drills? Why do you keep going back and forth? Why do you dribble it through those little cones? And why do you pass it back and forth to each other? Why? Because that's not soccer, right? But what it does is it trains you. It trains you. The more you do it, the more you do it, the better you get it, the better you get it. What's the scripture do for you? It trains you in righteousness, right? It's trying to take your vices, like this idea is that, what do you do in soccer? You see, you see some kids, they haven't got it quite right, so you're trying to train it out of them. Some kids, they've got it right, you're trying to train it better. So you're trying to teach them the things that matter so that when they're playing the game eventually, they don't have to think about the doctrine, they already know that. They don't have to think about their position, they already know that. They don't have to think they're running the right way, they already know that. But occasionally God's got to speak to them and say, listen, just a little bit of a tweak, just a little bit of practice, that practice is going to make you better and you're going to play this game like it's a natural part of your life and your living, right? So I encourage you, read the word, that's what it can do for you and, uh, and I encourage you. So there's 11 things, there's a lot of things there that can all help you fan your faith into flame. That's like getting the blowtorch out onto that wet, damp fire and it will just take off, right? So I'd like to pray for you.
So God, I want to pause for a minute and I want to uh, think of each person here. For those who have said, uh, God, we want to do a sincere faith. We want to, or we've got a sincere faith, but we want to do it better. We're still growing. We're still developing. We feel like the flames are flickering and there's, there's, a, there's a chance that we could do our faith better. God, I pray for each person who's in that position that uh, you would help them take the, the blowtorch, the, the, sorry, the, um, the, uh, you know, the blower, the, the battery-operated blower to their faith that they'd have the courage to own it, to just stand up and say, you know what, I am a Christian. I do believe this does make a difference. For those who need to find a mentor, God, I, fight, I pray if, if there's fear that you'd introduce them to someone who can help them, that you'd inspire someone else who is still stepping out to, to, to help them. Um, God, for those who have been thinking about the, the legalistic side of faith, I pray you'd help them to embrace the grace that you offer freely. For those who need to find someone to disciple, God, even tonight, I pray as we leave this auditorium, maybe there'll be an opportunity for somebody to just put their arm around someone else, to just give an encouraging word, to, to step out beyond their own comfort zone, to offer some kind of help, uh, and that we would, you would help us as a team to operate uh, as, as disciples and disciple makers. For some of us, God, I pray for those who need to put in a bit more effort. They've been floating along hoping that you do all the work, but just saying to them, you know, put in some effort, make, make a bit of effort in here. I pray for those who need to step up that way. For those who um, are easily sidetracked by all the controversy or, or, or the kind of or, or petty arguments about, you know, faith and religion, God, I pray, may they not be bound up by this, but be be loosened up to see the main things that you're on about and the things you want to accomplish in the lives of people. God, for those people who are dabbling their foot in the danger, the things that can cause them to fall astray, God, I pray you'd help them turn around and run away from those. And God, I pray that you give them the courage that's necessary to step up and to go in the right direction. God, for those who are hanging around people of, uh, who, who haven't yet gathered around people of faith, I pray you'd help them to constantly make effort to be amongst those who are believers, those whose faith can also encourage their faith. For those who have to make a courageous decision to walk away from somebody who's dragging them down, from somebody who's causing them to fall away from you, I pray you'd give them the mighty power of your Holy Spirit in their life to make these hard decisions. For those of us who need to embrace the power of God and not just the form of, go of godliness, I pray you help us. And for those who need to just embrace your word and listen to its teaching, I pray help each of us in the name of Jesus. Amen.